first bit of intro, this uh, time slot is usually the BioArtBot office hours. Um, so uh, we're kind of doing this as part of our uh, project feature for uh, both BioArtBot and Counterculture Labs. Um, and Sebastian really uh, gracefully um, agreed to present for us. So we're very excited about that. Um, BioArtBot is a project that is sort of uh, about making art through uh, collaborative tools built around robotics and biology. Um, if you're interested in more of that, uh, you can go to bioartbot.org or there is a checkbox in that uh, mailing list um, sheet that I just put in chat. And of course, if you don't know Counterculture Labs, I think a lot of you do, but uh, if you don't, this is a great time to learn about it because Counterculture Labs is open again. Um, uh, we are coming out of the pandemic and we've been able to, to reopen and uh, we're very excited. So this is a great time. We're open to members. So uh, if you're not a member, this is a great time to be a member to get in there and do community science. It's a biomaker space uh, located in the Temescal neighborhood of Oakland. Um, and of course we do, uh, we have lots and lots of meetings on Meetup um, of all kinds of different projects, including kombucha genomics, open insulin, um, oh gosh, Patrick, Jessica, someone, uh, what, what are some other ones? Oh, Griffison is a great one, antivirals. Real vegan cheese. Real vegan bacteria. cheese. Um, and so those are all on Meetup. Uh, check those out. And uh, we do these kind of project feature seminar type meetings uh, once a month on the second Wednesday of the month as well. Um, and if anybody's not a member yet and is interested in membership, I will we'll put the link to that page in the chat. There we go. There you go. All right, and I think we're going to have a few more people trickle in, but this seems like as good a time as any to get started. Um, are you ready, Sebastian? Uh, yep, I think I've got everything right. Great. Well, uh, then, um, you know, please give some visual claps or some clap reactions for Sebastian. We're really grateful to hear this talk about uh, DIY engineering. Um, take it away. OK, um, first, let me quick intro. Hi, my name is Sebastian. Uh, I'm currently talking to you from the third bedroom of my mom's apartment that I turned into a fully functioning molecular biology lab. And it's got all the trimmings necessary to do uh, biotech in the comfort of your own home. Um, I started with the tiny microscope under my bed and it, then it flourished into this contract research organization that I used to pay the bills. Um, so basically I offer plant genetic engineering consultation and actual proof of principle for startups as a, uh, as my for-profit company, uh, New York Botanics. And then I funnel all that cash into our nonprofit, Binomica Labs, where we use it to spread um, the accessibility of biotech to everyone so that people can do publishable research without having an academic background. Um, so that's basically our gist. Um, is my audio coming in okay? Yeah, okay, sweet. Okay, so without further ado, let me share my screen. Uh, share. And let's let's go let's go present present time okay okay uh where to begin um here we go so plants um i love plants i love plants so much um plants are fantastic uh is anyone here familiar with this plant in particular just any chance okay so um so romanesco broccoli right the um it has a fibonacci <laughs> spiral that actually is a, a mathematical fractal in a living being Right. So uh, I saw this at a grocery store one day and my mind just I, was, I could not believe what I was seeing. I, I thought I ate something the, the day before and things are just kind of trippy. Um, so I love plants. I love trees. Trees are awesome. Um, this is in uh, uh, this is General Sherman. He's 83 meters tall, this giant sequoia. It takes about 42 people to hug it in circumference. Um, but apparently, according to a recent article, trees don't exist. Right. Like trees aren't real. Um, things that we thought were trees, their ancestors weren't. Things that are not trees now, their ancestors were. Uh, trees are now a hotly debated topic, and it's kind of like everything turns to crab. In the plant world, things just become trees for reasons. Um, okay, so, but my main interest is flowers. So I absolutely adore flowers beyond any shadow of a doubt. Um, they're gorgeous, they're morphologically interesting, um, they, they have incredible patterns. Uh, iridescences, uh, sometimes fluorescences, um, but they're also a little strange, right? So on the left is Flitteraria meningensis, which is the snakehead lily, and it actually makes a checkerboard pattern on the leaf, on the flower petal itself. 
Um, it also happens to be the second largest genome on the planet, which is insane. It's anywhere from uh, 40 to 86 gigabases, uh, second only to Paris Japonicus at 156 gigabases. Humans are three gigabases in, pers in perspective. Uh, on the right is the Gemini or twin orchid, and they look like little fairies with little tails. Um, those are tails, not to be misconstrued. Um, they also get really weird. Right? So here are orchids. To the left are some weird duck things. Uh, to the right, um, right. So I don't, they, they're just incredibly strange. And uh, they actually get weirder. Like, what is this in the middle? What, what even is that? Um, so orchids tend to have the largest morphological variants of most flowers. There's 300,000 species. There's only like four or five really on the major market. The bulk of them are in Thailand and in the Amazon. And they're epiphytes. They grow on trees. So they don't always have leaves. My favorite, the ghost orchid, doesn't have leaves at all. It just has these beautiful tendril patterns of roots. And then this gorgeous flower that comes out every now and then and next to a bunch of gators in the Florida Everglades. Um, so flowers are my... Uh, my main interest, and I'll get back to that shortly. So I started with this. So this was the first microscope image I've ever taken. Um, and I used uh, fountain pen ink from my dad's inkwell and a lucky bamboo that I, uh, I chopped and my mom graciously allowed me to do so. And I put it under this like Fisher Price microscope that I got as a kid. And um, this is actually a scan of a 35 millimeter picture that I like lined up the camera into. And uh, eventually, this small lab underneath my bed evolved into this, which is my lab today. Um, and uh, basically, it's just an extension of being incredibly obsessed with the natural world and wanting to learn more, um, but also being a little bit disappointed at the fact that my academic uh, experience was extremely limited. I went to a very poor uh, high school. I went to a state school where we did like GFP E. coli once. Um, as part of our biology lab curriculum. And it just felt like extre extremely slow. And I was so excited to just get into it that I decided to like take my pocket change and fund my lab myself and kind of use it as a teaching experience while I was learning the techniques of biology. Um, because I work with plants, here's my grow rack. Uh, that's over that way. Um, lots of orchids, lots of different, uh, um, I work with petunia mostly. Uh, tobacco is my bread and butter for commercial purposes and uh, industrial use, but uh, petunias are my main thing. And uh, here's a picture of my like lab bench on any given day, right? So this uh, wonderful white petunia is basically an open canvas, and I'll get to some of the concepts that I'm going to apply to that petunia uh, that you guys might be interested in. Okay, um, so first I want to talk about a little bit of the actual biological uh, research, the biology that uh, my me and my uh, research partner, our lab group, is doing. Right, so we're two degreeless heathens in uh, in a bedroom lab trying to do biological research. Um, without any type of formal training. And so we, so we embarked about two years ago on a project that culminated in this. So this is our uh, paper. It's the draft genome for Dinococcus radiophilus, this extremely radio resistant bacteria, eight times more resistant than radiodurans that uh, everybody really loves. And it hasn't been sequenced. Uh, we got scooped on the actual first to sequence, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but we were gonna be the first to actually sequence it, do some interesting science using nanopore, and uh, because we got scooped, we decided, you know what, instead of doing a whole just a genome announcement, let's actually do some science. Um, so we analyzed the data coming from the nanopore for the last like three years. And here's the, here's the microbe as like an electron micrograph colorized. It's four cells in a tetrad, so it's like a four, four pack, and it's got three uh, uh, membranes. It's extremely hard to get into, and no one has ever documented in this species uh, a phage, right, a, a virus that infects this bacteria. Um, but wherever there is life, there is a virus, right? So we, would, we decided to try to explore maybe uh, possible hints at these uh, phages, either remnants or a prophage or some type, some type of phage-like machinery that's integrated into the genome that's been there for a long time. Uh, but we also wanted to prove that empirically using actual data. So we did some analysis and uh, started comparing it to its closest relative, Dinococcus proteolyticus. And uh, proteolyticus is very, very close to this one. And if you, uh, after a bunch of polishing with our genome, uh, well, you can actually see the colors match the, the colors in the image, the second image down there, uh, the colors ma match the homology regions, right? So the top bar is radiophilus, our radiophilus, and on the bottom is proteolyticus. And those little blocks start to coincide. Uh, these aren't. This isn't the actual chromosome. These are plasmids from these two microbes. 
So the previous paper that scooped us said that there was just one chromosome, no plasmids. They didn't really care much. Um, it was more of a genome announcement. We, like, we have very strong evidence to prove that there's at least three plasmids in there. And there's some very interesting uh, homologies to phages. So we notice first that there's this replication protein, uh, protein family 10134. And in all of the plasmids that we've, we've analyzed within this microbe that we've teased out from the genome data, we've noticed that it was, this protein has always been next to two specific protein sequences for PAR B and PAR A. Now the PAR stands for partitioning protein. Um, and those two always come in tandem as part of the theta replication machinery. And what's very, very interesting about theta replication is that it was first identified in P1 prophage. So the plot kind of thickened a little bit thinking, if there's a replication protein next to PAR A and PAR B, and its, its direct uh, model for this type of replication is in a phage, could this be a, a prophage hit? Could this plasmid have come from some, uh, prof, uh, some phage long ago? Or parts of this plasmid have come from that phage? So we did some digging and first uh, tried to figure out where are replication protein, the replication protein that helps actually replicate the plasmids in the, in the microbe, um, how is it distributed across all the phyla of, of bacteria? And um, we've noticed that the particular replication protein is extremely uh, present in DT, Deinococcus thermus. And there's a, there's a ledger on the right, on the right side. Uh, but that like teal color is the one we're most interested in, right? So our protein is mostly there, but it's also distributed in many other places. You could see it touching many of the actual uh, specific phyla. So we started digging even further, looking for actual phag phages that have our replication system. And we scoured all of the reference sequences of all known phages that have been published. And, um, and the first thing we did was also compare it to P1, right? So P1 prophage was, ident was identified in E. coli. And that's the model for, for uh, prophage understanding. Uh, like I said before, and it had the same type of machinery. It had these many rep repeat se uh, sequences next to a par A and a par B, but it used a different replication protein, even though it's in that same rep par A par B motif. So digging even further, we found this. So this is one of the only phages ever discovered that had 10134 uh, replication protein next to a par A-like protein with very high homology. If these are so close to each other and there's also repeats, there's extremely strong uh, possibility that this specific plasmid came from a phage, or at least this has some prophage origins. And so our, um, uh, our, main under our main focus was into not just presenting a genome, but also like diving deeper and trying to figure out what is the ecological niche of this organism, because it was actually found in the gut of a fish called the Bombay duck in the Ganges River. Right. So inside this, inside this fish, they uh, isolated some of the gut micro, microbiota, tried to sterilize it, and noticed that it didn't die. Um, and later, they've this was in 1962, and through a lot more processing, they've noticed that it was extremely radio tolerant. It, uh, it grew very slowly, and uh, it just existed. It, just, it was just there. And so the, uh, the study of this microbe didn't really further beyond that point. And so we decided, OK, it's available on uh, Carolina Biologicals, carolina.com. Uh, it's a great example of, of an extremophile in the sense of radiation tolerance. And there's no reference genome. So we decided to try it. And Christmas Day uh, two years ago, we got scooped for first the sequence. We had all the data. We were just about, we were finishing up assembly. We were polishing it all nice. And then somebody just brought the new Lumina genome. Um, so we decided to one-up them, and we made uh, we made basically our nanopore sequence better than an Illumina sequence, uh, an, an Illumina constructed genome, uh, polished it like crazy. We found uh, ribosomal RNA sites that were supposed uh, that the previous, the one who scooped us, the, their lab missed entirely. Uh, like I said, we also discovered some plasmids in there, and we're going to work on a shuttle vector to interface with Deinococcus radiophilus so that we can learn more about this micro. Um, now, going to a bit more about bioengineering. So on top of the biological research, we also do a bunch of bioengineering projects, all, again, driven by our interest. Uh, the first one, a while back, uh, I worked at the School of Visual Arts. And we were part of the biodesign challenge. And uh, back then, the challenges were uh, distributed as topics. So every school had a different topic. And uh, mind you, this is an art and design school, right? So just nothing but fine art students in a laboratory setting that was de designed for fine artists to explore biology. And so this challenge is supposed to be more speculative biology. And one of the students asked, um, 
how do we solve the protein issue going forward if we want to reduce uh, animal suffering and eventually move away into, uh, in, from meat consumption into veganism entirely? And so as kind of a tongue in cheek, we decided to make a literal beef steak tomato. So we took the protein from uh, the myoglobin sequence from both taurus from the cow, and we codon optimized it for tomato and then expressed it with a very strong constitutive promoter to produce it in all over the plant, basically. And just at the very last week before the, before the actual final presentations, we had a tiny little tomato that was PCR positive for our gene. Right? And then as after the conference, we decided to do some more analysis. Uh, the budget kind of ran out after that, because again, it was supposed to be a speculative design project, but um, I knew how to tissue culture, and I had like 17 art students that were just like biting at the bit to become, uh, to do bioengineering. So I'm just like, all right, let me just teach you some basic stuff. And then after like three weeks, they were complaining about my pipetting technique because it wasn't perfect, right? So it kind of carried over into this interesting, um, uh, super fast uh, mentorship boot camp of biotech where eventually they came out as just like very competent biotechnicians, even though they had very little experience. They went from what is a cell to how do we better engineer protein in, in plants, uh, which was really interesting. Um, it, was, it was a super rewarding experience because it, it helped me figure out how to teach people from, from scratch, from absolutely no experience and kind of let that go, um, let that kind of foster into whatever madness they come up with. Um, yeah, so that was super fun. Uh, here's the tomato uh, a couple weeks later. So this is an heirloom beef steak tomato. That's why it looks kind of funny. And but because uh, the uh, students I was teaching were fine artists and designers, they also decided to do some branding. So they took the Mayo tomato and kind of put it onto different uh, uh, different well-known brands like Mayo's tomato ketchup, Mayo's condensed soup. We made like jerky. Uh, of course, because it was a laboratory product, we couldn't actually eat any of of what we've made. Um, but it was just a really really fun experience to just try to tinker with. Uh, what is uh, what is an animal product? What is a plant product? How the the conversation between GMOs and how artists can be kind of a segue between science communication and the general public, being pro-GMO, being an anti-GMO is a ton of in very interesting conversations. Um, yeah. So the uh, second project I started a while back uh, started with the blue rose, right? So um, just a just a quick thing: what color do you think this is? What color do you think this rose is? Just a just a quick blurb, anyone. Purple. Cool. Purple. Awesome. Violet. Uh, my, <laughs> Violet lavender. Cool. All right. I would give them cool lavender at best, right? So, um, so a while back, Suntory, the Japanese whiskey company, teamed up with Florigene, uh, this uh, flower mo modification startup, more into flor floristry and breeding, to make the world's first blue rose. And uh, I saw the public the the presentation, and that kind of grinded my gears because I thought, okay, maybe I sh I turned off my blue filter or something's weird. Um, and uh, they were calling it the Applause Blue Rose, and they were selling it for about twenty five dollars a stem. Uh, and I thought that was kind of insane because uh, it's not blue, right? And at the time, I was doing a, a scientist in residence at this uh, middle school, and I had a bunch of like uh, uh, second graders, and I asked them, and just like, hey, real quick, what color is this? And they're just like, purple. And I trust their opinions more than anything because A, they were taught colors, B, they love colors, and uh, they wouldn't lie to me. They have no reasons or ulterior motives. Um, so if they say it's purple, it's purple. So I uh, decided to do a little bit of digging. And uh, lo and behold, there's actually a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of different uh, organisms that produce blue proteins, especially, specifically proteins, right? So chemical blue is very rare to find in flowers. It relies on anthocyanins and delphinidins, which are a little bit pH sensitive, kind of like how hydrangeas can go from red to blue. Uh, but in the oceans, there are plenty of blue proteins. Like for example, on the bottom left, there's this tropical clam. And on the lips, like it's not Photoshopped, on the lips, there's just this beautiful, brilliant, deep blue. And uh, doing a little bit of analysis on the published proteins um, and lining it up with GFP in the image that you see in the center, in the, in the center, there's about uh, six or seven uh, blue chromoproteins known, and aligning them showed extremely high homology, right? But the best part is that it looks like GFP. Now, if it looks like green fluorescent protein, and it acts like green fluorescent protein, then maybe I could express this in a plant, because uh, green fluorescent protein has been expressed in plants as a marker for a very long time, right? It's tried and true. Um, using petal promoters, we can get it into the actual flower, so it looks just kind of like the rose in the bottom right. Uh, but my biggest interest is also uh, the top right, which is uh, strawberries, right? Um, but strawberries aren't blue. So I was thinking of taking the white alpine strawberry, which is white normally, expressing the blue chromoprotein and calling it a snozberry, 
and then getting a bunch of kids to vote as to what the, what the flavor might be. And uh, when I asked this with uh, some of the students, uh, we, had a, we had a large voting session. They were very serious. And at the end, there was a tie between bubblegum and bacon. So I'm just like, uh, OK, bacon and bubblegum is going to be the actual flavor of this thing. Right? So we were talking about uh, imaginary biosynthesis of how the smell of, ba this, the smell of bacon and the smell of bubblegum could happen in a, in a strawberry. Um, so that was really interesting. They're extremely astute for, uh, for children. And that's one, one of the main reasons why I'm so interested in making uh, biotechnology, especially colorful biotechnology, accessible to, to children, is that they're, they're sponges, as many of you know. And they absorb so much of this information that they could be armed to better understand biotechnology as it further encompasses their lives, right? Like we're biotech immigrants. We were born as biotech was advancing. A lot of the kids born today are biotech natives, right? They're going to be affected by biotechnology more than any of us, right? They're, they're going to have decisions when they have kids uh, about way more genetic traits in terms of uh, customization and uh, particular selections, which is a whole other can of worms. But uh, educating them early is really, really important. Um, so I started off with the sequence for the tropical clam. And after a bunch of PCR mutagenesis and some optimization, I got to the color on the right. And then here's a purified sample of the protein. Right? This is crude lysate. It wasn't uh, any his tag or anything like that. This was just the cells were cracked, ran through a filter, called it a day. Um, so I was looking at this blue protein, and I said, OK, blue, cool. Uh, let's try other colors. Right? So here's red. This is uh, MRFP1, a monomer of DS red from discosoma, uh, an anemone, coral. And uh, I was like, OK, this, this is beautiful. Let's try something else. Let's try yellow. Right. So after a bunch of manganese mutagenesis, I got in some interesting yellows and I stuck with, with number 14. Uh, so we got a yellow, we got a cyanish, and we got a magenta. Cool. Um, what about black? Right. So uh, the actual black pigment in nature is extremely rare, uh, but in, uh, in animals and mollusks, especially like squid, uh, they use a wonderful molecule called melanin. Right? It's in our hair, it's in our skin, it's in our eyes. Um, and when you stack that molecule up, it gets the perception of black, of actual like obsidian, right? So here's an example from a paper um, using microbial factories to produce melanin over time. The bottom is hours in a bioreactor. And after like about 104, it's extremely, extremely black. So now we have cyan, yellow, magenta, and black. And um, so I took the, the sequence for the, the MEL-A, which is a tyrosinase, right? So tyrosine, when, um, when oxidized and polymerized using the, the tyrosinase, makes a chain of, insoluble of an insoluble molecule. And the longer the chain, the darker the molecule is. So left and right are about, um, I think it was like five days apart, just left it at room temperature. And it slowly got darker to the point where it started producing more and more melanin. Um, against the, and I have some other plates, I don't know why I didn't inclu include it in this talk, but I had some other plates that showed the right side being a control, the left side being positive with uh, tyrosinase, MEL-A, from Rhizobium etli. And uh, so slowly but surely, I was cobbling together the basic colors of CMYK, right? And so thinking into CMYK, I thought, OK, that's actually the subtractive color space, right? That's kind of how printers work, right? If you have a color printer, you have a cyan, yellow, a and a magenta, and a black cartridge. And they split little um, bubbles of each one. And as the bubbles coalesce, they produce the resultant darkened color, red, green, and blue, which our eyes will perceive as the uh, the subtractive color space. And so I decided, OK, what if we do this? What if we take the four uh, uh, color genes, let's say, the blue, the RFP, the, G the GFP that's yellow, and uh, the polyphenol oxidase, which produces the, the melanin color, right? And modulate the, the specific promoters of each one such that you can mix and match the intent, the uh, sorry, the amount of each protein or the amount of each uh, uh, peptide in the case of, of uh, melanin that you have in a particular cell, maybe a petal cell, right? Uh, I'm starting to think along the lines of dial -a color, where students can start uh, focusing not on the actual uh, synthetic biology of the expression of the genes, that, I mean, of the genes themselves, but actually of the expression, you know, working with synthetic promoters to fine tune the expression such that you have uh, shades of pinks and greens and blues and just every color in between, or even more interesting, uh, a flower that changes color throughout the day based on circadian promoter systems, right? A little bit more involved, but, uh, but you get the idea. It's, it's definitely possible because you have the building blocks right there. Um, so I decided to play around with uh, mixing proteins, right? So I, I extracted the blue 
the blue, pink, and yellow. And I started mixing them in equal volumes. This is just extract with nothing else. It's not like a fusion protein or anything. And I'm starting to get a beautiful green. Uh, green chromoproteins are super rare if they're not metal binding, like chlorophyll or things like that. Um, so um, I'm working on a, on, a, on a green right now, specifically by tying the blue and the yellow, knowing that now you can mix them around. And what's also fascinating is that they glow differently too as you mix them, right? So this is under blue light with an orange filter, uh, 471 nanometer light and an amber acrylic filter on top. Um, the mixing is also gradiated so you can get all the colors in between, right? Again, these are the same three proteins, not much has changed. And the, um, uh, the, the stepwise, I think it was 10, yeah, it was 10 microliters in a, oops, 10 microliters in a 200 well plate. Uh, then I got bored and I'm just like, okay, let's do a really interesting gradient, right? Let's go like concentrations this way and that way and downward with the three colors. And uh, yellow got lost, but surprisingly enough, if you put them under fluorescence, yellow's the loudest there. You can kind of fine tune the different amounts of, uh, of, these, uh, of this fluorescence, right? So now you have a different color space, the fluorescence color space to play with if you're doing uh, genetic design work. Um, so here's a project that just started uh, not too long ago. I call it the better than nothing turbidoscope, right? A lot of folks have done uh, really wonderful work using 555 timers and Arduinos to do basic turbidity meters, you know, like spectrophotometers fixed at 600 nanometers. Um, I decided to harken back to the good old days of the 80s and use a chip that drives LEDs as a decade, uh, like a decade counter. So basically splits a voltage into 10 and lights an LED for every step along that voltage. Um, so basically with just a handful of analog parts, no microcontroller whatsoever, you can actually get extremely fine um, resolution for a calibration standard. So I'm working on ways to produce a calibration standard using oxalic acid, which is a precipitate. And if and I'm going to calibrate it against my real spectrometer and then come up with a, a recipe so that you can make your own standard at home and uh, basically know exactly when the optical density of your bacteria growing in a flask hits 0.5, right? Which is kind of like the, the, the sweet spot that a bunch of gray beards a long time ago said, this is how you do it. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that it varies very much between the genotype of the bacteria. So actually getting a stepwise increment of the growth phase is important because mid log is not a function of just optical density. It's a function of the displacement between the stationary phase and the lag phase, which could be this way. It could be skewed. It's, it's a whole bunch of different ways. But in general, 0.5 is awesome. So working on that. Um, here's a really fun one. I'm super excited about this, right? So I would love to work with mutagens, but all mutagens are carcinogens. Right, so uh, EMS for plants, right? You just put a, a couple drops into, into some seeds and then come out looking all crazy. If you get that on your skin, there's a high likelihood that it becomes carcinogenic. But there is a slightly safer alternative, which is a really common microscope stain called methylene blue. Now, uh, methylene blue by itself does nothing, but in the presence of 660 nanometer light, so very red light, it starts producing reactive oxygen species. Right. The nice part about methylene blue is that it also intercalates with DNA. So it actually slaps onto the DNA uh, major groove, just like ethidium bromide, for example. Um, and then when you turn on the lights, while attached to that major groove, it starts spewing out reactive oxygen species as it reduces in the environment. So, um, so it produces a, a singlet oxygen radicals, which shear and break DNA. And... Um, and so I wanted to explore that as a means of doing very, very quick mutagenesis without manganese, which is the typical way to do mutagenesis via PCR. Um, manganese binds extremely tightly to TAC polymerase, tighter than magnesium. And because of that, it forces the polymerase to make mistakes, more mistakes than it normally does. Um, but manganese, especially manganese chloride, is an environmental toxin, and not many people can get their hands on it. So I don't want people working with acute uh, carcinogens, and I don't want people working with environmental hazards. So uh, methylene me uh, mutagenesis uh, is one option. It goes uh, G to C, which is wonderful because a lot of G to C mutations are non-synonymous amino acid mutations. So you get like actual changes to the protein structure. Um, and uh, so our first run was a 24-hour overnight. We just wanted to see an insane signal. And um, on the gel, you see from left to right is the ladder. Uh, methylene blue plus light, uh, methylene blue, I mean, no methylene blue and just light, right? So just the lights on with no dye. And the other one is just the dye and no lights on, right? So the combo actually obliterated the plasmid. You know, we took 350 nanograms of plasmid and it just, it's gone. 
And so I thought, okay, maybe it's like intercalated and weird, or it's occupying the major groove, so you can't see the fluorescence. So I tried transforming the, the, the plasmid sample, the rest of the sample into cells, and that's the three plates that you see above, and it tracked. Um, looking at the tubes themselves after 24 hours, M on the right is just methylene blue with no light, so that's our negative control. And all the way on the left is our experimental, you can see the blue actually faded. Right? And one of the hallmarks of methylene blue uh, reducing is that it fades from blue to colorless. So it's doing stuff, but that stuff is also inhibitory. So we're trying to play around with, don't obliterate your DNA, but just change it enough so that we could see something. Right? And we're working with our blue protein to make it fold faster and do all kinds of stuff. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, another really, really exciting project that I'm super, super, super stoked to get uh, into the hands of everyone is this. So this is a way of selecting with sucrose instead of antibiotics, uh, plasmids in E. coli. So a lot of lab strains that, uh, of E. coli that's not K12 or W, E. coli W lineage, don't have the CSC regulon, which are the, the operon of genes required for the permease, the invertase, and the regulatory protein to help bacteria to convert sucrose into glucose and fructose. Um, in taking the gene from E. coli W and just expressing it by themselves on minimal media with just sucrose as the main carbon source gave us this. So on the left is a regular E. coli with, uh, with uh, minimal media plus sucrose. And on the right is E. coli uh, with the same plasmid carrying the CSCA gene uh, in minimal media with sucrose. So we were getting colonies while on the negative control, we were getting nothing. Right. It's a little you know, hit or miss, and the colony sizes are different because we're working with starvation as the main selection pressure. But the amount of antibiotics that you don't need would be wonderful because there's a lot of places that want to do uh, biotech, especially in schools. But uh, ampicillin, for example, in India is a frontline antibiotic, right? In many other countries, it is. In the United States, it's useless. Most things are just resistant to ampicillin in most cases. Um, and, uh, and or even just access to these antibiotics are extremely difficult to get by. So in doing so, they, um, they've kind of set up this, this gatekeeping barrier for people that want to explore, even in, in, in you know, like academic settings. Like, let's say it's not legal to do uh, genetic engineering at home, like it is in many countries. Uh, in a school, there's many ways to actually get permits to do so, but then you can't buy uh, ampicillin and canamycin. You have to revert to like uh, shady dealings with um, strange people. Um, and I wouldn't want that, right? So we're working on ways to import the sucrose pathway, the permease as well, to make this more robust, such that in the end, all you need is super cheap minimal media and sucrose as a means of maintaining, um, as a means of maintaining plasmids, right? So genetic engineering minus the, you know, the antibiotics. Uh, one of our other projects is Halobacterium, right? So Halobacterium cellinarum. These are extremely halophilic bacteria. They live in, they're super happy in media that has 250 grams per liter of salt, right? That's an enormous amount. That's such an enormous amount that it's, the media is toxic to most other living things, such that you can actually work with halobacteria media in open air. You don't need a laminar flow hood. You don't need a fancy, um, uh, what you call it? You don't need a, a fancy like dead air box or anything like that. We personally just in the lab, just work with it in the open air. And these commonly exist in salt plains. So on the left, you see in the, the Utah salt flats, this beautiful divide uh, between a lake and an actual uh, salt flat. Um, so the, the pink is actually from the bacteria itself. They produce this bacteria rhodopsin that actually helps them do anoxygenic photosynthesis. They literally use light to turn an ATP wheel, right? So they're kind of, they're solar powered microbes. They don't do synthesis, so they don't generate carbon molecules from CO2. They don't fix carbon but uh, they get powered by the sun. Uh, and in doing so, they survive in this like wonderful uh, ecological niche where they just thrive. And in that thriving is visibly seen here. Um, on the right is the uh, Hillie, I think it's called Hillie in New South Wales in Australia. Uh, a lot of these were discovered in Australia. Australia is a wonderful place for discovering all sorts of ancient life forms like stromatolites and um, bacteria that's existed before plants were a thing. And uh, you can also buy Halobacterium from Carolina. So we decided to focus on Halobacteria uh, NRC1, uh, which has been sequenced a while back. And uh, the beautiful part about this bacteria is that it, is, it lives in an extreme environment, but for it, our environment is also equally as extreme. So if you take Halobacteria and you put it in water, it just explodes, releasing its proteins and its DNA. 
you can literally do a DNA prep with water, right? So no mini prep, no fancy uh, wash buffers and things like that. It's literally just spin it down, crack it with water, and you have beautiful high high uh, concentration DNA. Um, so we wanted to you know start making some open source tools. So here's a draft of a Halobacterium E. coli shuttle vector that we're working on uh, using uh, Novobiosin, which is an antibiotic that's 35. It's not actually an antibiotic, which is cool. Um, but it's $35 for a gram, and you need one microgram per liter to have this as a, have this effective, right? So like one gram will last you a lifetime. And it poisons a gyrase that actually rotates as the DNA unfurls. And if you poison that, you stop replication. So it's not an antibiotic that if it enters the waste stream is uh, going to somehow compromise uh, our uh, frontline antibiotic use cases. Novobiosin is very rarely used in medis medical treatment, um, and it's fairly accessible, but, what if we couple the sucrose genes to our halobacteria, right? So what we found out is that of all the halobacterium-esque and related family bacteria, halobacterium has no means of eating sucrose whatsoever, like at all. It barely has the means of eating glucose, such that it's actually not fully confirmed whether or not halobacteria can or can't eat glucose, which is surprising because glucose feeds into the Krebs cycle that's you know, conserved across most life. Um, so we were thinking, what if we take some of the genes from uh, more uh, from from sucrose capable, like sucrose, to not sucrose tolerant, but um, ones who can metabolize sucrose effectively, and move those genes over into a little bit of metabolic engineering? Uh, it's about six or seven genes, and uh, actually get Halobacterium to eat sucrose, but not as a microbe, as a plasmid. So you can do selection with Halobacteria using sugar. So now you have a microbe that is um, that explodes in, in seawater, let alone freshwater or distilled. It can't survive on your, on your tabletop or anything without extreme amounts of salt. Um, it won't require any antibiotics, and it has no chance of escaping into the, into the sewer system because it will literally just go, right? So it's essentially gated itself to be an incredibly useful tool for amateur research and DIY bio in general <clears throat> because we won't be introducing genes that other microbes can trade during bacteria sex. Um, so this is going to be a really long and uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, this is going to be a really long and slightly difficult project. But uh, we're really hoping that once this is up, we shift our entire work to Halobacteria in general and just forget about E. coli entirely. Because if we can do DNA preps in 15 seconds using spin down and water, um, the amount of savings of plastic reagents of time is innumerable. Um, the caveat, of course, that whatever you're expressing has to be salt tolerant. But in it, that in and of itself is interesting. Like what if all the genes that we express are natively salt tolerant or just salt tolerant enough to do their job? What kind of enzymes because we, can we engineer for drought tolerance and salt tolerance in crops, for example? Um, the, last, the last project I'm going to talk about is uh, the biggest project I've ever been involved in. It was actually for making a flower mascot for the Tokyo Olympics. Um, so myself, uh, along with Elizabeth Hanaf, uh, from NYU Tandon, uh, Chris Mason from Wild Cornell, uh, folks at the Media Lab, and of course the Mori Building Company that built all of downtown Tokyo, uh, basically got together and tried to figure out how to take the logo on the left of the Tokyo Olympics and put it on a flower, right, through genetic means. So no screen printing or anything, but actually producing those patterns. And like I said a while back, there's a flower that has a checkerboard pattern on its on its petals, but unfortunately it's the second largest genome on the planet, right? And um, so that was, that was an insane uh, ride. I've, I learned so much, I cried so much, um, it was brutal. But the, uh, the things that I learned there inspired me to continue this project beyond the, the set, for lack of better words, shit canned uh, Morning Glory project and uh, pursue this along with Elizabeth towards actually getting spatiotemporal control of biopixels, of dots on a petal, right? Um, so shout outs to Barbara McClintock, uh, she is my hero. She was the one who discovered uh, plant transposons, the jumping genes, by studying corn. Um, every now and then, field corn has these uh, purple dots on some of the kernels, and it varies where some have more, some have less, some are all purple, some don't have it at all. And with very careful, meticulous observation with microscopy, light microscopy, like just regular microscopes at, uh, uh, at Cornell, um, uh, she was able to deduce the jumping gene, which later uh, she won a Nobel Prize for. And uh, these jumping genes are everywhere in nature, right? So here's a morning glory naturally patterned with these stripes. 
this transposons basically jump into a pigment production pathway, interrupting the sequence, making it not functional, and then they jump out at a certain point. And these radial patterns can grow. Uh, these radial patterns can also be interrupted, which is very interesting. Like if you notice that all of a sudden there's a stop go, there's just like yellow, 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 red for a little bit, and then yellow, yellow, yellow. The most fascinating is that if you look very carefully, there are almost single cell points, right? Or maybe like 50 cell points that are isolated on, the, on those petals. And in flowers like the Peruvian daylily, uh, those particular dots are not random. They're actually super reproducible. There's like three dots in the center that you see on every Peruvian daylily flower. And so that there's a controllability to this interruption. Um, there's also this, I mean, like what even is this? It's circular, right? So the uh, petal cells grow out radially, but these somehow stop in type of a diffusion pattern such that it looks like a Rorschach, right? Um, and we're slowly become, be, uh, beginning to unravel the mysteries behind how these patternings occur. Um, here's a, an amazing example. This is uh, glass corn, right? So um, Native Americans have, have bred corn to look so absolutely mind-blowing and have all the colors of the rainbow because of anthocyanins, pH uh, modulation, and of course, transposons. You can buy seeds for these. Um, and my biggest uh, attempt at any type of transposon modulation was actually by accident, right? So I have this flower that I really like. It's called uh, Four O'Clocks or the Marvel of Peru. The scientific name is Mirabilis Jalapa. And uh, it has, it's known to have transposons that kind of just interrupt the genes. And here you see uh, two flowers on the same plant. And um, every time it blooms, it has a different flower. But so what I tried to do is do some tissue culture and incorporate a D-Cas9, which is a broken Cas9 that just binds to a sequence. I basically wanted it to shut up and just stay one color, if, if that's possible. Right. Um, so in my failings of the tissue culture and engineering of this plant that hasn't been engineered yet, uh, I managed to get it to dwarf and do this. So those two images are actually on the same plant. So I have a plant that now is in its like fourth generation. It's going to bloom hopefully in a couple of weeks that every single day there's a new flower. Right. And every single time uh, there's a new pattern on that flower. And due to uh, stress and particular light cycles, you can get something like this, right? So this is the, the best flower I ever did, I ever not made, basically. Uh, it's like 90% nature, 5% me making a mistake, and 5% uh, question mark, right? So I call it the fire of the day, the, the four o'clock flame. And so, um, so all of these these mistakes and lessons learned are kind of culminating towards my one day, uh, my goal of one day being a flower designer. Uh, kind of like the Willy Wonka of flowers minus the sexism, racism, and all the strange slave labor. Um, and just be extremely open about how to get people more engaged in flower design. I don't want to be exclusive in this case. In fact, my biggest goal is one day for my work to be trivial. So uh, everything I do is in my, in my open lab notebook that I have on as a link in my bio of all my social media. And I'm uh, just going to be slowly pursuing this until either I cease to be or I make an interesting flower. Um, and hopefully other people can join because these technologies are becoming more and more accessible to the point that maybe one day, once learning about variegation and all kinds of pattern modifications, we can get to something like this. So this is, these are two pages from Luigi Serafini. He wrote this book called The Codex. And it's written in a language that doesn't exist. It's all made up. And it has these, these drawings of a planet, a strange planet. And a lot of them are tongue-in-cheek puns of like funny things. Like on the right, top right, there's a flower that rains on itself. Um, but a lot of these, if you really take a second to look, aren't really that outlandish, right? Like the lace, the lace work on the leaf in the, in the, the middle, the middle bottom. Uh, that one's an aquarium plant. That's a common aquarium plant. There's uh, the latter one, super interesting, the, the, the ringed ones. I mean, like, I actually don't see how some of these can't possibly uh, be possible at one point. But the beauty of this is that none of these really look like flowers seen in nature. And that's kind of the goal. Can we take synthetic biology and, and essentially bio art and mix them together to produce flowers as a means of self-expression? Um, so that's kind of, kind of where I'm at right now. And thank you all so much. Hey, yeah, thank you, Sebastian. Let's give him a hand. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't notice the chat. Ah, oh, crap. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. Uh. Uh, so I think this is probably a pretty good time for questions. Um, 
I think, uh, yeah, I was watching the chat. I think there were maybe a few questions in there. And so maybe uh, uh, maybe just repeat it because the chat was kind of going because there was just sure. so much cool stuff to talk about. Um, sure. So I I'll lead off. Uh, the first thing you talked about was uh, open, uh, open lab notebook. I think that's one of the coolest things you do is that you just have a Google Doc and it's just like, well, here's your, your work. Um, yeah. And what, what sort of prompted me to reach out to you in the first place uh, to say, hey, I think it would be really cool if you gave a talk to us was that you were selling one of the plasmids you designed on Etsy, which is unique and kind of new. And I guess, you know, why not? Um, They're handmade, technically. <laughs> yeah, so it's a craft. Um, and I guess I'm just curious how you think about uh, uh, sort of openness generally, biotech has such a uh, focus on IP, designing something and then sort of owning it over here. And I mean, from your point of view, like for instance, the stuff you sell on Etsy, I bought a, a tube of it and it literally just came in an envelope. There was no MTA, anything. I mean, is that yeah. stuff just like, yeah, it's out there in the world or, and is that how you think about all your work? Um, yeah, yeah. I'd like to, to live by the flawed example that whatever I do is an open book and that people can replicate. Because um, when I first started, a lot of the technologies that I was really interested in was patented. I mean, I got slapped in the face with the cease and desist when I was trying to use the blue a protein because as I was working with it, I realized that Florigene patented transgenic blue in flowers, right? So uh, the Wall Street Journal picked up uh, uh, an early attempt at my Blue Rose thing. And then I got a nice letter in the mail going, don't do it. And I go, watch me. Um, because you can't, you can't possibly say you patented blue and flowers, right? So that kind of uh, took me down a path of disenchantment where I'm just like, okay, if I lose out on some type of grand fortune, you know, TM, uh, that's, uh, that's actually okay. Right. Because I'd like I'd like to be at least one of many examples of people who are trying to make, focus on science being actually accessible and not accessible with the caveat where whatever will make me the most money, I'll keep a secret. Right. So, like, I mean, I'm under NDA for a bunch of projects that I do contract research for, but I don't have much stake in there. Right. In fact, people come to me because they know I don't ask for any type of equity in what, what they do. They just don't have a lab, especially during COVID. Right. I was like one of the few labs actually operational because it's in my house and I had to stay home. So it kind of worked out for me. Um, but yeah, no, the like literally everything I do is open source and uh, like I'll happily die on that hill, essentially. Awesome. Any other questions for Sebastian? I'll keep going. I've got like 30 or 40. Oh, I see. Sahib, you have a, you have a hand up? Uh, yeah, you're working mostly with pigments, but I was wondering if you could also alter the ultraviolet reflectors on the flower's petals. Hmm. OK. so. Um, I love that you mentioned that. Um, there's a biofilm growing in my uh, mangrove jars that has this like beautiful structural pattern of like just assembly of the of the microbes. It looks like a CD shimmering in a, in a reflection, and um, that's that's actually one of the the much much bigger goals, right? So I'm starting with pigments because it's easier to teach, right? It's just four genes, and you change the expression, and you get different colors. Um, the real goal is morphological change. Like I showed in the very last slide, the uh, the amount of absurdity, right? And having something that could look like the mirror spider, right? So if you ever get a chance to Google the mirror spider, um, it literally produces mirrors on its back, right? It like layers its keratin in such a way that it's almost 100% reflective. It looks like someone glued bits of aluminum foil to its butt. It's insane. Um, and if biology can do it, why can't plants, right? So getting to the point where if it's this like iridescent psychedelic flower at some point would be incredible, right? It's just, it's definitely beyond uh, my current understanding of plants. And also um, we're not quite there yet as a, as, a, as a community in terms of the tools to really explore those without just like going, okay, here's a million dollars, go make an iridescent flower, right? Um, so hopefully as technology trickles down and as we get more advanced in this and as more people start pooling in their resources to do grander projects, we could probably get to that point. And that would be incredible. Yeah. yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Um, I was actually wondering, um, the DCAS9 that you introduced to the flowers, is that something that like, for example, like I can use in my home and try it out with some flowers or um, how how did that go about? Okay, so um, so I borrowed a plasmid from uh, a friend of mine that has university access that uh, gave me basically an ad gene plasmid um, and used that. I basically lifted out the Cas9 uh, from that, the DCAS9 from it. I gave it the guide RNAs. <clears throat> 
and then I used agrobacterium to transfer the genes into it, right? Now, um, I've had the agrobacterium for uh, a quite, quite a number of years, and it's a bit expensive, but if you get that microbe, you can do everything else, right? So once, it, once you lift the sequence out of an adgene plasmid, it's no longer an adgene plasmid and can be disseminated, right? Um, I haven't put, put that on my store yet, um, for reasons that I actually want to modify it a bit because it's a bit of a mess. It's just super bulky. It's enormous. It's like 29,000 base pairs, which is why. Um, and uh, I'm basically working with the golden braid standard now to make everything all nice and modular, right? So that in the plasmid images that I've shown prior to, every single part of that plasmid is modular. I designed the entire thing from the ground up. Basically stared at Puck 9 and said, this isn't good. And basically removed all the legacy parts and made everything nice and modular. Um, so in the next coming months, I'm actually going to have a whole slew of Cas9 tools that'll be available on my store as well. And um, I would submit them to AdGene, but the problem is, as soon as I submit it there, no amateur biologist has access to that, right? If you're not in a community lab or you're not affiliated with the university, they won't ship to a residential address. So it's kind of like shooting myself in the foot. So I'd rather charge not $70, but 20 bucks. That's kind of my go-to. All my plasmids are 20 bucks. Um, really, really basic tools are $10. And uh, yeah, and just sell it to my friends. And that just basically... Um, covers the upkeep of the synthesis, right? So like I paid a ton of money for synthesis and that'll eventually just cover it and I'll be happy. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Any more questions? All right, I've got hey. one. Oh, no, go ahead, Srinivas. Hello, good morning, morning. Gore. Um, the uh, fire of the day, you called it, the transposon, the yeah. genesis flower. Um, yeah, do you actually sell that as well, like cuttings or seeds of those? That's really cool. Yeah, so what's really nice is that now after the fourth generation, I can't, I've been trying with many, many primers, I can't actually amplify any of the DCAS9 integron, like in the integration chunks. So there's a very high likelihood, because I've been just backbreeding and backbreeding with the original to get rid of that, um, that, there, that it's actually non-GM, right? It's just I'm super, super like cautious about releasing anything that's actually accidentally GMO. Um, so until I actually fully sequence it, I can't distribute it just in good faith because it initially had an agrobacterium insertion event, even though it was a single event um, and I PCR'd it and it was there. The primers no longer bind, but that doesn't mean that the chunks are not there. And according to the USDA, if any foreign ingress that is not of the natural gene pool, as of the recent addendum to the law, uh, is present, that's technically a GMO, whether it functions or not. Right. And that's a federal felony if it's released un unlawfully without a permit. Uh, so I really, really want to tread lightly before I actually distribute that one. But hopefully I can just breed out and make sure that there's nothing. And it's really on my docket to actually sequence this, because if that transposon can be lifted, I'd love to put that in Petunia, because it's wild. I mean, literally a new flower every day. Right. Yeah. Well, I have a question, Sebastian. Sure. So what if um, I'm playing with like algae or something uh, in my lab and, and I, I find some interesting mutants, uh, is that considered a GMO or is that like, like what is the legal status? Okay, so foreign ingress of a, of a gene is the, the, one of the main definitions of it, right? So uh, according to the recent very, very sane um, uh, USDA guidelines on what, for example, with plants, and it carries over to other recombinant work, but uh, what, what, a, what they consider the extended genome is anything that can graft to that plant, right? So if you're taking genes from another algae and moving it in, there's a very high likelihood that that's not considered GMO. But if you take uh, pieces from a jellyfish, right, like a GFP, and you put it in there, it's actually GMO unless it has been deregulated in a product, right? Because as soon as it becomes GMO, if it's not food or feed or food or feed adjacent, it has to go through field trials in order for it to be released, right? But if you do just mutations in a lab and you just have a strain that without editing just does something different, that's 100% not a GMO. That's just a mutant strain. And you can distribute those freely. Like the Yale yeast repository has some of the biggest collection of yeast mutants on the planet, right? And a lot of them are not GMOs. They're either wild type or they're uh, bred in the lab to have a particular function through directed evolution. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to ask about your use of golden braid. Um, yeah. So if you wouldn't mind explaining, I mean, I'm particularly obsessed with MoFlo at the time. Okay. Being, um, I just want to understand why you made the switch. Okay. Um, okay. So if, uh, for anybody who's not familiar with golden braid, it's a type of iterative cloning standard 
that utilizes type 2S restriction enzymes that uh, bind here and cut here, right? And they cut four base pairs away such that the cut sites can vary. And if you modulate those cut sites, you can have parts that standardly apply. That's golden gate, right? Um, the golden braid aspect is that you can iteratively daisy chain parts together infinitely. Because when you fuse two of the golden braid parts together, they form the entry vector of another fusion in this like braiding pattern, right? It's, I mean, it was, it was, it really gave me a headache trying to understand it, but the amount of grammatical control, the amount of granular control of the elements within to make it a, a truly like Lego-like toolbox is insane. Um, the second is that golden braid was specifically designed with plants in mind. So AT rich, uh, uh, plants, plant genomes are very AT rich. The genes are super AT rich. Um, so the actual cut sites uh, are calibrated such that it has the highest propensity to be uh, compatible with plant promoters, for example. Right. So knowing that this is Golden Gate Moclo for plants, and a lot of plant biologists are picking this up, I thought, why not have the standard applied to our own practice? Right. Um, because I have my own internal standard of four restriction enzymes, not not really like um, uh, what you call it, like uh, Biobricks, because it doesn't. There's no idempotence. It doesn't iterate. But um, every lab has their own standards. But it seems that golden braid is actually picking up in plant world. And I'd love to just be standardized with that, because one day maybe I'll have a collaborator that'll work with me and it'll give me some parts that I can share with everyone else. And it'll save us, you know, thousands of dollars of synthesis because our parts match. Yeah, like it's only a standard if you actually use it in that sense. So the best standard is the one you use, and hopefully more people will actually be interested. Just two enzymes. Cool. All right. Um, OK, any last questions here? I think, Sebastian, you've probably been talking for a good while. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry if I went a little too fast. That was. Uh, that was quite the unload. Um, yeah, also, everyone, feel free to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. My Facebook profile is an open lab notebook. And um, there's a link in all, all my profiles for the lab notebook. And I'll be restructuring that lab notebook to actually be project-based. So it'll be just like many lab notebooks instead of one already 500-page monster PDF. Um, that's hard to deal with. So uh, yeah, and you know, my phone's like surgically attached to my hip. So feel free to ask questions anytime. and. Um, yeah, and the only thing I ask is pay it forward. If you if you know something that you really like and you want to share with others, do the same thing. Be as open as possible. Because the more people doing stuff, the larger our community is going to grow. But more importantly, the more stuff that you'll be able to do because you'll you know benefit from the tools made by the folks who who you've taught. All right. So it all kind of comes back full circle. Not to get all romantic about it. That's a beautiful way to finish. Um, yeah, all those links are the meetup that you, you signed up for for this uh, should be there. Uh, Sebastian's Twitter, the lab notebook, um, uh, I, Binomica Labs, I also linked. Um, and yeah, let's let's give uh, one more visual round of applause here. Thanks so much. That was so cool. That was really great. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for sharing.